everybody. It is time to talk about patterns of inheritance, which can be found in chapter eight of your textbook. Uh, this is a really great chapter in my opinion. I think it's a nice culmination of everything that we've learned thus far. In a couple past chapters, I believe it was um, six and seven, you started to learn more about how actual cells divide and using mitosis or meiosis, depending on what uh, species they were, and how the genetic information of DNA gets passed on from parent cell to offspring. Well, this chapter takes that a step further, and now we're looking at the physical components of the offspring. And in relation to the parents, do they look the same? Do they have the same traits? Do they have differences? And how are those traits passed down onto the uh, child or offspring? So I think this is going to be really fun. We're sort of taking everything we've learned and now we get to see a visual representation of that which I think oops I dropped my microphone <laughs> I think it's a lot more fun um, as far as this chapter goes to really see what's happening now we're not at the little microscopic level or the um, talking about things that might be a little bit hard to relate to. Um, these are traits. These are physical things that we can see. And so I think it's going to be really relatable. So now we've gone from those atoms to the molecules, to cells, to tissues, to organisms, to learning how those organisms reproduce. And now we're going to see how um, the offspring start to come together as their own individual um, persona, if you will. Okay, so let's get started. The first sections of chapter eight are going to be dealt, dealing with what we call Mendelian genetics. And this stems from the person that uh, discovered these processes that we're going to be talking about. Um, the latter half is going to be um, information that we've learned since Gregor Mendel's studies. And so, you know, as I'm always saying, science uh, even though we think of it as something that might be rigid and set in stone, it really is not. So science through the years changes, especially as our technology changes and gives us the ability to see more and do more, go to more places that we've never been able to go to before. And so um, that really has changed the way scientists work. And so there's this large gap of time that um, we've had all these new improved studies um, basing all the studies upon what Gregor Mendel did. So um, let's start with a um, definition of genetics. You've probably had this before, but we're going to repeat it. Genetics is the study of heredity. And so remember the heredity Think of inheritance, heredity. These are the words that mean that we are getting traits passed down from our parents to ourselves. And you can take that all the way back to like chapter five and seven, or excuse me, six and seven, um, where we were talking about the um, reproduction of, you know, cellular reproduction. And we had the parent cells passing information of DNA off to the daughter cells. So it, it, it's the same idea, only now we're on this large organismal um, scale. We're talking about fully developed organisms and what those organisms have inherited from their parents. So Johann Gregor Mendel was a very interesting fellow. Um, back in his day, he was actually a monk, but monks were um, a little bit different than what you might think of monks today. Um, we don't have a lot of exposure to monks in America, but um, the his particular type of monk um, was one that dealt in um, 
in the intellects, if you will. So they were very much, um, in addition to their spiritual aspect, they um, delved into mathematics and science and chemistry and nature and all the studies of things around them. So they were the scholars of their time. And Gregor Mendel was such a person. And he set the framework for genetics and um, this was long before we ever knew about the words chromosomes or genes. Um, these things hadn't been identified yet and uh, meiosis had been sort of discovered but not really to the extent that we know it today. Um, we knew that cells divide in some manner and that the time of Gregor Mendel um, doing his studies, meiosis was just in its beginning phases of understanding. And so um, Gregor Mendel in his um, sanctuary, I, I guess you could say, um, had a garden and he decided that he was going to study um, these pea plants that he had in his garden. Um, he noticed that, you know, here's my seeds that I put in. I know that they're going to be purple or white, let's say, but hey, I'm noticing that their offspring as they um, age and have children, so to speak, um, they're a little bit different. They don't have 50-50 um, of the traits that the parents have as far as visually speaking. Sometimes they look more uh, like a hundred percent like one parent or the other and he thought that was interesting and it intrigued him um, so he selected this simple biological system he conducted methodical quantitative analyses using a large sample of sizes of these pea plants and the good thing about pea plants is that they can replicate very fast and so he didn't have to wait um, you know 18 years till it became an adult and had offspring of its own like we do with people um, he could have offspring very quickly so like within a week let's say um, I don't deal with plants so I don't know how fast plants actually replicate but um, it's uh, a very fast process and so it was a very good subject to study um, what's really nice too is that you're going to get to see how the scientific method is working. He took the scientific method and he um, really devised his own project and he took into account variables and the control groups and experimental groups and things like that. And so he was very, very methodical in what he did. He was very precise and he notated very well and thankfully we have all of his notes today and we were been able to build upon them. And so um, let's delve a little bit deeper into what he had done. So this slide is just showing you um, a reminder that um, Gregor Mendel was uh, doing this work in the mid 1800s and um, he, he studied genes and chromosomes, yet he was not using those specific terms yet because they had not been derived. Um, during his studies of the pea plants, he focused on seven different characteristics, which are shown here in this next little section. Uh, we looked at seed color, whether uh, between yellow and green. He looked at seed shape, round and wrinkled. He looked at seed coat color. So these are like peas in a pod. Have you heard that before? So that's what that means. It, it, there's a pea and then it's got this coating or a pod around it and so um, one was gray one was white the pod color itself was yellow or green the pod shape could look inflated so a little puffier or constricted so it was a little bit more um, indented and the peas were a little bit more defined within um, the flower position Axial means that the flowers were um, along the stem. So think of your arms as your axial components. So um, the flowers were on the stems of the plant or um, they were either on the terminal end of the plant, which means the very top. Terminal means ending or in this case, top 
of the plant. And then he looked at stem length, which was um, either short or tall. So that's a lot of variables to consider. And when he did these uh, experiments in his experimental design, he did not look at everything all at once. He took one variable, such as um, pod color, and he only focused on pod color. That was the only variable that was isolated. Everything else was all the same. Okay, so he didn't, he wasn't looking conjointly at pod color and seed color. Um, the, in some cases, he may have later on, once he got the hang of what he was doing, but to begin with, um, and for a good experimental design, you just focus on that one variable, and then you can sort of ignore everything else, which is nice. This is just another slide to show you um, the seven characteristics that he focused on. Seed shape, seed color, flower color, pod shape, pod color, the flower position, and the stem height. And so those are the seven characteristics of inheritance that he focused on. Let's step back a moment and just have a quick refresher. Um, the segregation of genes we've learned about in the past. And you know the word homologous, it means um, to be alike. Uh, so we have homologous chromosomes. So remember those little um, band-like structures on each chromosome, um, each one looked the same. Okay, so we had one from our parent, one or one from my mother, one from my father, they looked exactly the same as far as the location of the banding, which were the alleles, which indicated different traits. And so um, homologous chromosomes separate during meiosis. Those gene pairs on the chromosomes will also separate. And so that's how um, we get genes from our mother and genes from our father. So each gamete that forms carries only one of the two genes of a pair. So each gamete, remember, is a sex cell, um, will only carry one gene, either from the mother or from the father. And then as they reproduce, they will mix in some form or fashion. So um, for Mendel's studies and what you often see in your textbooks, um, as well as others, is the focus on plant color is usually um, studied more so than like the pod color or the height of the plant and things like that. We, we talk about those as well, but um, we're going to focus on the plant color just because it's an easy visual to understand. And so basically, if, you, if you're into flowers and you've studied roses in any case, um, you'll know that people who grow roses will oftentimes try to uh, make hybrids of their own. So they'll take um, one type of rose plant, let's say, well, I don't know the names of them, so we'll just talk about color. So let's say they take a purple colored plant, a uh, rose plant, and then they take a another rose plant that is white and they will take the white bud and they'll splice it onto the plant of the purple plant and the offspring hopefully if the hybridization took will show a combination of the two in some way shape or manner um, that's a very basic overview of how that happens <laughs> um, it, it's actually quite scientific when you get into it. But um, so be thinking in those terms here uh, when we're talking about these plant colors. But the process is called hybridization. And so we're taking, uh, we're going to sort of force mate um, two true breeding individuals. And true breeding means that you're having a true characteristic of one plant and a true characteristic of another plant which are different from each other. So in this case, a true purple plant and a true white plant. Okay, um, so those are true breeding individuals and they have different traits, in, i.e. the purple and the white. Um, so Mendel collected all of these seeds 
and um, he started making these crosses and they're normally self-pollinating so it was done very easily the um, he could manually transfer that pollen over to another plant to sort of force this uh, growing in a faster um, fashion or he could let it happen naturally which of course takes a little bit longer but still is quite fast compared to other species that you would maybe think about crossing so in this picture here it's showing you the two breeding two true breeding plants. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> um, those are going to be represented by what we call the P generation or the parent generation. So we're taking a plant that has violet flowers and a plant that has white flowers. Notice there aren't any other colors on there, so we call them true breeding. Um, and we're going to cross these. Once we've hybridized them or we've crossed them, the offspring we now call the F1 generation. Okay, and so um, the F1 generation sort of baffled Mendel. He did not expect a solid colored plant to derive from the two parent plants because he had two different colored parent plants. And so he was expecting a combination in the offspring of those two. So he was thinking a white and a, a purple uh, you know, both those colors showing up on the plant or a, um, let's say, a watered down version of the, of the purple, maybe like a really pale lavender because you're mixing white with it. Um, but that wasn't the case. The F1 generation looked exactly like one of the parents. So the purple offspring looked like the purple parent. That really confused him. And so what he did was he took two of the F1 generations um, so two offspring so let's say you've got a p generation here of a mother and a father plant we'll just say and then next to it you've got a second p generation of a mother and a father plant so you've got two mothers and two fathers all four of those plants those true breeding plants will have an offspring so the mother and father on the left will have a an offspring and a mother and father on the right will have an offspring. Those offspring are the F1 generations of those parent generations. Now, because those offspring are not related in any way, they had different parents, um, we can cross those. We can take the offspring from the um, parent generation on the left which would be the F1 generation on the left and cross it with the F1 generation on the right. So we're taking two F1 generations and we are crossing them. The result is going to be what we call the F2 generation. Okay, so you've got the parent generation, just has the parents, the true breeding plants. Then the F1 generation is their offspring. The F1 generation is crossed then with another F1 generation offspring, and they get an F2 generation. What is very unique here is really kind of what clinched in Mendel's mind. Ah, I see what's happening. There are traits here that we can see in the true breeding plants that will eventually come about in the F2 generation. If you notice in the F2 generation, we now again have an offspring that has purple and an offspring that has white. So his thought was, where the heck did that white offspring come from if my F2 generation doesn't have any white on it? So he went, aha, he had a light bulb moment and he said, oh, the white trait, the white flower trait, didn't go away in the F1 generation. It's still there. It's just masked by the purple trait or overshadowed by that purple trait. And so when we cross those F2 generations again, it then had enough variation where we could have the purple plant coming out again in the in the offspring and lo and behold here's the white offspring again and it was able to have a white offspring in the f2 generation because in the f1 generation the white did not go away it was just overshadowed okay so think about that for a minute it's a little complicated 
as you're saying it. Um, for me, I have to stop and think and look at the pictures. So parent generation has the true breeding plants, purple and white. F1 generation is their offspring and has the um, purple color. The F2, or excuse me, F1 generations are crossed and you get the F2 generation and you have one offspring that's purple and now we have one that is white. And that white is still available um, in genes, um, in genetics terms, because it was just being overshadowed in the F1 generation. It didn't go away at all. It's always been there. It just was overshadowed. Okay, and so let's talk about... Um, some terms here. The, when I say overshadowed, basically, or masked, um, basically what I'm saying is that in the F1 generation, you've got that purple plant showing as offspring, but now we know that the white color is still there. That white trait is still in that plant. It's just not being shown. It's overshadowed or masked. That is because now what we call the purple color is a dominant trait over the white trait. So um, you have a dominant trait, which is purple. It's overshadowing or masking the recessive trait, which is the white trait. Okay, I know I'm spending a lot of time on one little picture, but this is important. So think about it. Your F1 generation... Your purple is the dominant trait, and the white is still there in that F1 generation. You just don't see it because it's a recessive trait. Okay, so make sure you understand those terms and this process. Um, all F1 generations will show in their offspring only the dominant trait. So now we can look back at the P generation and go, oh, okay, out of these two true breeding plants, we know that the purple plant is dominant over the white plant. That's just how the genetics work. So that's why when we cross them, the F1 generation, F1 generation will only ever show the dominant trait. In this case, it's purple. So if I asked you, I gave you, um, a parent generation and an offspring. And let's say I had um, a pink poodle and a white poodle. And those are my two true breeding P generations. And then I had a um, pink F1 generation. Then I know I can say, hey, out of these three organisms that you're seeing, the two parents and the F1 generation offspring, um, what is the dominant trait here? And you could say, oh, well, it's at the F1 generation is showing pink in the offspring, so I, therefore I know that that's the dominant trait. So F1 generation only shows the F1, or excuse me, only shows the dominant trait. The F2 generation will show both. It'll show the dominant and the recessive. Are you tired yet? That was exhausting. <laughs> no, but it's very important and it's very fascinating. And remember, he didn't have all of these tools that we have today. You know, he, he had to do, come up with this all on his own. He didn't have any reference to go to and say, oh, I've got this textbook here, or I have this paper that was published, and let me build upon somebody else's ideas. He was the original person to come up with this idea. And, you know, today they always say, oh, there's no original thought. Well, that may seem true, but every now and then you get people like yourselves that have a unique mind um, that are brilliant and, and observant and creative and can come up with these ideas and and ways to test them and luckily in most cases today we have the tools to support all of that whereas Mendel had nothing he had to create all of this from scratch the only thing that he had basically was the um microscope at this time was just starting to um, be developed into something that was somewhat remote of what we use today. So it, it, it's pretty impressive. 
Okay, so you guys know me. You know, I'm a freak about dogs and animals and stuff, but I love, love, love dogs. And um, one of my favorite types of dogs are these teddy bear golden doodles. And um, we're going to talk about what a golden doodle is. Um, thinking back to the uh, Mendel's experiment there with the P generation, the F1 generation, F2 generation. So the next few slides are going to kind of illustrate that just in another way, a little more modern way, a little more fun way in my um, uh, reasoning. And so if you take a purebred golden retriever and a purebred standard poodle, remember those standard poodles are the big ones. Um, and you, those would be your parent generation or your P-Gen as they're sometimes abbreviated. Um, and note here that this particular golden retriever is a blonde color and the, um, or a cream color if you will, and the poodle is a black color. So right away you know that when they cross their offspring is going to be a dom the dominant color. And I bet many of you would say the black would be the dominant color, but as you can see here, um, that's not the case. And so um, there's just some things that you can tell, you can guesstimate at, you can go, okay, this would be what I hypothesize. I hypothesize that if I have a cream color golden retriever and a black color standard poodle and I mate them, their offspring are all going to be black. Well, you do your experiment, you have a litter of puppies, which would be the F1 generation, and there's not a single black one among them. So you can say, well, my hypothesis has now been rejected um, because the F1 generation is not black, it is in fact this cream color or light color. And so that's what all F1 generations will be in this particular case, um, because we're mixing these two purebreds. And now we can say, oh, okay, I have this F1 generation that's cream colored, that is my dominant color. And I know that because it's my F1 generation. Let's move on and see what else happens. Note that the, um, under the pictures, it says F1 golden doodle, which is golden retriever times poodle, 50% poodle, 50% golden retriever. Um, and then it says, some will shed a little to none. Others have a bit more, but nothing like a golden retriever. They're allergy friendly. So that's a nice quick abbreviated way to say that I am a breeder. I have these two purebred animals. I looking for offspring that will have better traits, the better of both P1, or excuse me, both parent generations um, into the F1 generation. So I want the best I can get out of the golden retriever and the best I can get out of a standard poodle. And so basically I want a golden retriever, but I want it to not shed and I want it to not be, um, Al, you know, cause allergies. And so mixing it with the poodle kind of waters down those traits and um, they're less uh, shedding and they have less um, allergens in them. And so now we've got this um, F1 generation puppy that's a little more desirable perhaps than um, either of its parents. I wanted to show you this particular screen um, because we've simplified things with Mendel's um, experiments where we've taken two purebred parents, crossed them, and had an F1 generation. We know that the color showing would be the dominant trait, and then if we cross two F1 generations with each other, we get the F2 generation, and now we've got both traits showing again. Um, in this case, colors, and uh, we've got the dominant and the recessive showing in the F2 generation. Well, breeders today, especially this particular um, company, and on the previous slide it has the website to this company, um, it's worth taking a look at. And what I really, really like is that this breeder is serious about um, producing puppies that are um, 
environmentally friendly, if you will. They are uh, allergy free or they are allergen friendly, if you want to say it that way, um, and they don't shed as much. And so everybody wants a puppy that doesn't shed, right? I mean, who wouldn't want a dog that doesn't shed? And so um, they're very particular about how they cross their puppies or their adults and um, they're looking for very specific things in their offspring. And so if you look at this, um, this particular slide, in between the F1 generation and the F2 generation, there are other crosses that can happen. And this particular company, um, call this particular cross that we're going to talk about the F1B, as in boy, generation. And that means we're going to take a purebred poodle, a parent poodle, a P-gen, and we're going to cross it with an F1 generation. So not its own offspring, but somebody else's offspring, just so you know. Um, and then we're going to get what we call the F1B generation. That F1B generation is now 75% poodle or parent poodle and then 25% of the F1 golden doodle generation. So that's that's the cross here. So we've got the purebred poodle. We're mixing with the F1 generation, which is 50% poodle, 50% retriever. And then we get this F1B generation, which is, oh my God, so cute. Um, what is happening here is we've got we're crossing in this manner because we want a coat that maybe is a little bit tighter, curlier, um, or maybe a little bit more hypoallergenic than what the um, golden retriever would have. But we still want that golden retriever softness and um, coloring. And so we've kind of gone backwards in a step um, for this breeding to happen. So this is called the back Cross. We've got the F1B Golden Doodle that is now produced. Um, Non-related poodle parents are crossed um, with an F1 generation, and uh, you get the 75 to 25 percent mix. Let's look at the next slide. This particular slide is just building upon what we've been talking about, um, again, in this puppy form. And I'm using these puppies once because they're so cute and because I think it's more relatable than maybe a pea plant would be. Um, I like to just assume that more everybody's like me and doesn't do plants, but they do puppies. <laughs> so um, we're gonna talk about puppies. So we just talked about the F1B generation to get very specific, um, traits in that our offspring puppy. So the F1B puppy was really tightly curled. It had a lot of, um, had little allergens, I should say, and then it had that nice cream color. Well, now we've gone another step further. So we had talked about, um, here's our F2 generation. We've already talked about how we get that. We take the F1 generation and cross it with another F1 generation, and then we get our F2 generation. The F2 generation should be showing traits of um, both parents. So it's going to show a dominant trait and a um, recessive trait. Now, if you look at this F2 generation puppy, he's not showing any of the black or any of the white from the original parents. Um, this one's just showing like a white coloring. Well, his siblings, because usually there's going to be more than one puppy in a litter, um, there's going to be a mixture of black and white puppies. Um, traditionally, you know, there are some weird things that can happen that we'll talk about later, but um, this is just one F2 generation puppy. The others in that litter would have a mix of the dominant and recessive traits. So we've got the, each F1 is half retriever, half poodle, and then we get a um, result of a 50% poodle plus a 50% P-gen parent retriever, which again is similar to the F1 generation. So this, um, the F2B, as it shows here, um, is an F2B golden doodle, which would come about by mixing an F1 golden doodle, which we have here in the first picture, and another F1B golden doodle. 
So there'd be a second one that had happened here. That would be like the back cross. So we're mixing a, a regular F1 generation cross with a back cross. And then we get this golden doodle that's going to be even more fluffy and probably even more hypoallergenic and, um, you know, that creamy color because it's a dominant color. His, uh, nose shape has probably changed a little bit um it, instead of that long pointy poodle nose and now he's got like the shorter golden retriever nose um, so there's different things that breeders look for in their puppies that they try to breed for specifically sometimes they get this weird anomaly happening um, that is unexpected and sometimes it's a good expectation unexpected, and sometimes it's a bad one um, Sometimes we get mutations, and the mutations, we've talked about those in the past, where um, it will change uh, the genetics completely, and that mutation will be passed on from offspring to offspring. So if, let's say, this particular F2 generation puppy ended up purple, okay? Well, obviously, the breeder didn't want to breed for a purple puppy, and so um, he would take that purple puppy... And those two specifically F1 generations, and he would not breed them anymore because you don't want to end up with purple puppies because that's a mutation. You don't want to breed the purple puppy to even a cream colored puppy or a black puppy because that mutation is in its DNA and it's still going to be passed on. And so his offspring have a high chance of being purple as well. Okay, and so these are the things that happen when you're actually breeding animals or plants or whatever it, ha it may be. So it can be very scientific and that usually the really good breeders will have very specific logs of which puppy or which animal they've bred and when it was bred last and when it's due to breed again because um, unlike backyard breeders, um, true good breeders that are concerned about the um, breed as a, as an overall uh, worldwide breed um, they will only breed every two years in most cases um, and that is for the health of the mother um, if you're breeding every time the mother goes into heat that mother's um, resources are going to be diminished time and time again she's not being given enough time to build up her strength and that's where a lot of mutations start happening in those puppies and that's where you get this puppy mill syndrome thing that happens or oh she's in heat we can go ahead and breed her right now but you're going to end up with mutations and you could end up with deformities and all sorts of things and so um, these good true breeders will have these records like this that will show okay, this is exactly what happened. And they can refer back to it and then they can look at their notes and go, hmm, maybe if I had bred this one with this one, I might've gotten this particular result. Let's go back and try that. And then, you know, just, they're kind of like doing their own little scientific experiments every time. Okay, enough to talk about puppies, I'm sad to say. Let's move on. So remember earlier I had talked about the homozygous um, allele and all this stuff. Um, homozygous means having identical alleles of a gene. Heterozygous means you have two different alleles of a gene. And an allele is a chromosome, is basically an alternate form of a specific chromosome. And the next slide will it'll make a little bit more sense but um, organisms will breed true for a trait because they carry identical alleles of genes that govern that trait so let's think of it like this you've got a parent you've got two parents a male and a female the male is going to give a gene for something and the um, female is going to give a gene for something let's go back to plant color so the male's gonna give, let's say he's the dominant, has the dominant trait, so he's gonna give that purple trait, um, purple color trait, and the female's gonna give the white color trait. Those are two different colors, meaning that they are heterozygous to each other. The alleles mean that it's the same gene, so we're looking, the gene means plant color, but alleles mean that there's gonna be two different plant colors okay 
An allele is an alternate form of a gene. So I've got the gene for plant color and I have heterozygous alleles or heterozygous chromosomes, which means that those plant colors are actually different. Um, one on the parent, one on the, excuse me, one on the father and one on the mother. Um, let's look at the next slide so it, it will make a little more sense. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. These long purple segments here that you see, one on top, one on bottom, um, those are your chromosomes. So one from the father, one from the mother. At the band that it's showing, that's the band for flower color. That is the um, chromosome or trait for flower color. That's where it's located on that chromosome. So every chromosome, we'll just generalize here, um, every chromosome for plant color, the band is going to show up in that exact spot on every single chromosome. If let's say that pink band was down at the other end, then you have a mutation happening because it's still for plant color, but now it's way down here over on the left and that's wrong. So it's got to be a mutation. So for now, we're going to talk about that they are in their specific loci or loci, locus. You'll hear all different kind terms of that word um, in relationship here. So uh, these are homologous chromosomes and they're homologous because they are both showing plant color. The allele means that there's two different colors, okay? So we've got a homologous pair of chromosomes for plant color, but the allele on the top, let's say from the father, um, is purple, it's the dominant trait, and the allele on the bottom is the, um, let's say from the mother, and it's the white flower or the recessive trait. So it, each chromosome, one from the mother, one from the father, have a um, allele for plant color, and it's just that they're different types of plant color that's showing up, the dominant or the recessive. So thinking about that last picture with the two chromosomes, um, picture how that band was and then picture a whole bunch of bands all along the length up and down the length of that one chromosome or both chromosomes actually so there's many 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 bands or there's many 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 chromosomes uh, or not chromosomes there's many many alleles on the chromosomes that indicate for different traits so that one that we looked at was for plant color uh, maybe another band was for the band uh, the plant height um, another one was for the pod color, and so you have all these different bands up and down the length of a chromosome. And so a particular set of alleles in an that an individual carries is called the genotype. So the genotype is all the different alleles or chromosomes that a person or being an offspring has, okay? Um, organism has. The traits that we can see is called the phenotype. Okay, so that means gene expression results in phenotype, which is an individual's observable traits. So gene expression means that we um, are visualizing the gene that is expressing that particular plant color for, let's say, or plant height or whatever trait we're looking for. And so whenever you're looking at some organism, what all the different traits and things that you see about it are called its phenotype. So it has a phenotype for hair color and a phenotype for skin color and you know all, all different kinds of things. So when you look at each other, you're looking at each other's phenotype or their um, expressible, observable traits. Okay? An allele is dominant when its effect masks that of a recessive allele paired with it. We've already talked about that. Um, these are terms you should know for future reference. So whatever you observe is your phenotype. What makes your phenotype is your genotype. So your um, phenotype is dictated 
by your genotype. So whatever your genes are on those chromosomes, whatever those alleles are, that's going to uh, be, that's going to determine what your phenotype is. So think back to those purple chromosomes with the bands on them. Um, whatever those bands are of alleles or genes say, that's what you're going to look like when they're mixed. So genotype determines phenotype. So to fully understand the genotype gives rise to phenotype thing, um, we've got these other pictures to show you. So far we've been looking at pictures that like those on the right. We've only been looking at phenotype, been looking at purple and white and you know, what's the offspring going to look like? What's that puppy going to look like? That kind of thing. Um, this particular slide will show you how we got those colors. And so the um, first column is your genotype and your second column is your phenotype. Okay, so let's take a look and see how this happens. Now, keep in mind, remember your parent generation, your p-gens um, were crossed and got your p1 generation, which was the um, showing the dominant trait and then your p2 generation um, were your uh, showing the dominant and recessive, okay? Or excuse me, your F1 and F2. Uh, so think about it in those terms. So genotype, we've got the, um, we represent the genotype of this phenotype as two capital P's, which means they're homozygous for the dominant allele P. So in this case, P means purple, okay? We have a, this first plant here is true bred, so it means it's going to be the parent generation or the P gen, and um, it's the PP. So remember, we've got to have two. Uh, we represent our genes as two because one comes from the mother, one comes from the father. So in this case, it's a purebred, so we've got PP, and they're capitalized because they are um, dominant traits. If you look at the next one where it shows white, these are homozygous for the recessive trait or the recessive allele of P, but in lowercase p. So when we talk about dominance, when we write about them, we write capital letters. And when we talk about or write about recessive traits, we do lowercase letters. All right, so this makes it very easy to determine if something is homozygous or heterozygous when we're looking at the, the letters representation in letters. So we've got the two P's, that means homozygous because they're the same. Remember, homo means same. And then homozygous recessive for the lowercase P's. There's two of them, so it's homozygous. It's little, so it, little P's, so it's recessive. We know that the dominant color is purple, and we know that the recessive color is white, and so we can write them out in this way. And then we've got this um, capital P and lower P here, and now we've got this thing that says heterozygous for alleles capital P and lower P. This is your F1 generation. This is a combination of the capital P, which is the purple, parent and the lowercase p, which is the um, white parent. You've got the dominant purple and the recessive white. You'll notice that above the purple, the, p, is, the purple that has the two capitals, the homozygous for dominant um, allele capital P, that is your parent generation. And that ha just happens to be the dominant one. And then the uh, white plant is your um, P gen or parent generation that's recessive, which is the means it's homozygous recessive for the lowercase p or white. And therefore the F1 generation is the capital and lowercase combination. And now we can easily see there's one of each, so they're not the same, so we call them heterozygous. So if I gave you nothing but this first column, and I said, uh, which one is heterozygous? You would 
easily say the bottom one because it has one capital and one lowercase. Those are not the same, so therefore they're heterozygous. This is yet another representation of what we just talked about, about phenotype and genotype. And um, clearly you can see how important these things are because we keep repeating them. Keep, I've shown you 15 slides of essentially the same thing, um, just kind of building upon these concepts. So um, take that to note that it's very important that you understand these, okay? Um, this is just another chart, another way to represent what's going on. Um, let's take the phenotype column first. So you have the capital P, which is a parent generation. You've got a parent yellow and a parent green. When they cross, you get the F1 generation and whatever color they come out to be would be the dominant color. And therefore we could look back and say, okay, that color in that parent is the dominant trait. Um, so here we have yellow. So we know that yellow is a 100% yellow progeny, if you will, um, from the hybrid, indicates that yellow is the dominant trait. So the P gen that is yellow is the dominant parent. Once we cross fertilize the F1 generations, we get those F2 generations. And now we've got a thing that's happening that shows how we get both colors coming about. We get 75% yellow progeny or offspring, if you will, um, and 25% of the green progeny. So it's not 50-50. We've got 75% here and we've got 25%. So let's say this was, um, was the dog. So now we've got 75% um, or three out of four um, puppies that are white and one that is black. Okay. So this is how we're expressing in our situation. So if you think of it in puppies, um, you've got the white puppy and the black puppy and they cross or adults and they cross in the F1 and you get a hundred percent of the cream color, um, or white. And then when you cross those, the F2 generation ends up being um, 75% white and 1% or excuse me, 25% black. So it depends on how you want to think about it. Um, the next column is your genotype. And so we're just going straight across. We're just going to represent these now in different ways. They're the exact same things that we're talking about. We're just showing you a different way to look at them because one deals with phenotype, which is the outward traits that we see, and one is the genotypes of how we got those outward traits, okay? So P generation, we've got on the left, lowercase y's, and on the right, low, uh, capital y's, okay? So these are purebreds because they're both the same, right? They, they don't have one of each. They've got two little ones or two capital ones. Right? And so when we cross those, the dominant one's going to show. Right? So we get a cross. We've got to have a big one and a little one because with their cross, you're not going to get just two of the same. But we get 100% of the offspring are going to be big Y, little Y, which means that they're all going to be yellow. Okay? Note that the small Ys, the two small Ys and the two capital Ys in the P generation, those um, are homozygous. And then the offspring in the F1 are heterozygous. It has one of each. And then in the F2 generation, when we cross again, uh, we get a whole lot of mixture happening here. So it's just like before where we've got 75% yellow and 25% green. But the way we get those yellows is because we've got 25% um, are coming with two capital Ys. So those are homozygous Ys, homozygous dominant, so they're yellow. And then we get 50% that are a mixture, a capital Y and a lowercase Y. And that means that because there's still a capital in there, that's a dominant one, so it's still gonna show yellow. And so that's how that 75% maintains itself. So when we say the 75% yellow, it doesn't mean that they're all going to be homozygous. 
you've got 25% homozygous and 50% heterozygous. And then the other 25% is going to be homozygous recessive down here. So again, homozygous dominant are the two capitals. Then you've got heterozygous, which is capital and a lowercase. And then you've got um, homozygous recessive, which are the two lowercase uh, yellow, lowercase y's. So there's a lot to these charts, but um, take it slowly, break it down, understand that the genotype will dictate what the phenotype means, um, and it will start to make a lot more sense. But um, it's very important that you have an understanding of how these crosses happen in relationship to heterozygous, homozygous, parent, offspring, F1, F2s, um, and the percentages in each cross, how that happens as far as phenotype and genotype happen. So pretty much everything you see on these charts are important. So here's an interesting figure. This really cute little child, I think. A little, I'm guessing a little girl, little boy. I don't know. <laughs> I would say little boy, but then I look at the colors on the shirt. And anyway, cute little boy, I'm going to say and his mother um, look very different from each other, obviously. You might at first glance think, well, if they're um, parent and child, perhaps the child is um, mixed race or adopted even, you know, because uh, clearly doesn't look anything like the mother, um, except for the, maybe the wider nose base there. Um, but this, the little note here on this chart says the allele for albinism expressed here in humans is recessive. Both of this child's parents carried the recessive allele. So this is in fact her biological child. And um, he actually is, um, we'll just say African uh, descent. And just like his mother, only he's albino. And albino just means that there is no... Um, you lack pigmentation, you lack coloring, you lack melanin in your cells. And so you re, um, come up with this white appearance or this clear appearance, if you will. All right. And so thinking about what it says, we know that that's his mom. Um, and it, but it says both of the child's parents carried the recessive trait for albinism, which is why they had a child that was expressing this albino trait. If in order to express this trait as a recessive, what generation would that make this child? Yeah, think about it. It would be, he would be considered, if we go back to our charts, um, our simplicity of our charts, um, we, we would say that he is um, an F2 generation because now let's say he has siblings, more than likely he's got, um, you know, three other siblings that have the dominant trait and he's the fourth sibling and he has the recessive trait. Because remember our chart said that in the F2 generation, we get 75% dominant offspring and 25% recessive. So this is your, he is your F2 generation, your, his mother, is the um, F1 generation, and uh, she is a heterozygous dominant um, capital Y and a lowercase y. So heterozygous means she's got one of each from her parents. She's dominant because she's showing um, black coloration, and um, when she was mated with her husband, let's say, um, he had the exact same traits. He was also dominant and a heterozygous dominant. So he had a capital and a lowercase letter. And when they combined, they had at least one child that was um, albino. So when you look at pictures like that, try to think back. How, how did that happen? Go back, see if you can come up with what the parent, the grandparents in this case would look like. Go back to your other chapters where you started to learn about meiosis. Um, this is the first division of meiosis. Remember that meiosis sort of repeats itself. So we've got meiosis one and meiosis two. 
In meiosis one, we end up with um, two daughter cells. All right, and if we were to carry on into meiosis two, we'd end up with four gametes or four daughter cells. But just in meiosis one, we're talking about the two daughter cells that are, can inherit um, any of the traits that we've been talking about. So law of segregation will state that paired genes must segregate equally into gametes or sex cells, if you will, or the daughter cells here, um, so that offspring have an equal likelihood of inheriting either gene. So these daughter cells are, have an opportunity to inherit either homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or heterozygous traits. Remember, these are the traits that um, you would see in an F2 generation. You've got the homozygous dominant, and then the heterozygous, um, or excuse me, yeah, the homozygous dominant, the homozygous recessive, and then the heterozygous um, alleles. Okay, so you have different, the um, law of segregation is just stating, hey, these offspring have an opportunity to equally get um, all one of the available uh, genes that are, are there. So if I have a dominant recessive, a dominant, um, uh, sorry, a homozygous dominant, a homozygous recessive, and a heterozygous genes um, in my F1 generation, then my F2 generation will have the ability to get one of those. All right, and there's three possibilities for every F2 generation but um, obviously can only choose one, okay? Um, but there's three possibilities for each. So that can be a little complicated when you look at the picture and when you're reading it, um, but just think of it in, as F1 and F2 situation. So um, in this case, interphase would essentially be, right before that would be the F1 generation. And now we're going to be segregating out and doing our cell division and then the daughter cells would be the F2 generation right here in the anaphase one or excuse me in the telophase one you would have the opportunity here as daughter cells to you would both have the opportunity to have homozygous dominant homozygous recessive or heterozygous offspring okay it's not just going to say hey you daughter cell up here on the top I'm, you can only be dominant, and you on the bottom there, you can only be recessive. Well, that's not the case. They both have the opportunity to be one of anything, okay? So think of it as a, <laughs> you're, a, you're a kid in America, and you have the ability to become anything you dream of. Well, that's sort of the same thing here. You daughter cells have the ability to become any one of these three genetic choices, This is a test that you can do if you're not sure where the dominant color is coming from. Um, let's say you knew one parent was uh, homozygous recessive, which would be the green color on the right. And then the other parent, we know it's, um, it contains a dominant gene. We just don't know what the second gene is. is um, we know it's dominant because of the yellow coloring. Yellow means dominant. Um, so we know it has a, a capital Y for sure, but we don't know what the other um, zygote is, okay? And so what we do is we create this test cross to see if we can figure it out. We put the recessive on the left of the square, which is the lowercase y's, and then the uh, top of the square would be the capital Y and then the question mark because we don't know. So let's bring down from the top uh, left hand column we bring down the Y into the first square and that's a capital Y and then we do the same for the square underneath it that's also a capital Y. Then we bring across the uh, recessive parent which is the lowercase y we bring that across once and then again, and then we bring across um, the lowercase y on the bottom for both of those squares. 
Um, the only thing we don't know now is that right-hand column, we only have recessive Ys in there right now because the other gamete is a question, question mark. And so um, if we know that that is yellow, that's going to be dominant right away. And we know that the other gamete's recessive, then that has to be a capital Y in order to make those squares yellow. Okay, and that means the question mark is a capital Y, because that's what we had to bring down. That indicates that the yellow coloration or yellow M&M, &M, if you will, um, is a homozygous dominant. So your F1 generation here is a mixture of a homozygous dominant and a homozygous recessive, and they get a nice heterozygous offspring. Okay, and then another way you can say it, um, let's see what they're doing. They did another test cross resulting in a one-to-one -one ratio of yellow to green offspring, indicating that the parent is heterozygous. So you do the same thing. Um, in this case, the two on the right are going to be green, and we know that green is recessive, so we know that that question mark has to be a lowercase y, which means a capital Y and a lowercase y is a heterozygote. Okay, so th these are quick, easy tests that you can do um, if you have enough of the information. I just wanted to give you a review of a couple of terms and introduce some new terms to you as well. Um, don't take this slide to mean that these are the only vocabulary terms there are in this chapter, because they're not. Um, I just need to refresh a little bit before we move into the next material. So we just learned about law of segregation and test cross. Um, law of segregation states that the paired genes must segregate equally into gametes or daughter cells, if you want to think of it like that, um, so that offspring have an equal likelihood of inheriting either gene. So it has an equal opportunity to receive a homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or a heterozygous gene. Okay, equal opportunity here. The test cross that we just did um, is actually a form of a Punnett square. And you've probably heard that term before, but we've not really done too many um, Punnett squares, if at all. We probably did them in lab more than we did them here. Um, but a test cross is a Punnett square test that can determine whether an organism that is expressed as a dominant trait is heterozygote or homozygote. Because remember, if we have a dominant, we, don't, we might not know how we got that dominant trait. Did it come from a um, dominant homozygous um, parent or did it come from a dominant heterozygous parent? We're not sure until we do this test cross. And it's a quick, simple, easy test that you saw that we could do. Um, so a Punnett square, I'm kind of working backwards here a little bit. A Punnett square um, is when you have gametes of two individuals that are distributed in a grid formation to determine whether the offspring will be homozygous, heterozygous, and what their phenotype might be. Okay, and so that's just like the test cross that we did, only with Punnett squares, you typically know all four gametes. Okay, if you don't, then you do the test cross, then you can apply it in a Punnett square formation. Um, we have a couple types of Punnett squares. We have a monohybrid cross, which is what we do typically because it's the easiest, um, which is a Punnett square that tests one physical trait or phenotype. So um, in this case, we've been testing pea color or plant color, those kinds of things. Um, a dihybrid cross is just a Punnett square that tests two physical traits or phenotypes. Um, they're a lot more complicated to do. You have to be very careful when you're bringing your um, gametes across in the squares so that you don't goof it up. Um, it's very easy to goof up, and I usually do, <laughs> so it takes me a couple of times to try, but you have to be very careful with it, um, and as long as you go slowly and you're following what you're doing, you should be just fine, um, but monohybrid crosses are typically what we'll be doing in this class. Okay, so we're going to show you this um, Punnett square, but before we get to that, there's some things that you have to understand, um, sort of as background information of how 
we put or how we get the gametes to put into the Punnett square. And so this first section, um, so just think back going to the first, very first slide that we talked about with um, parent generation, um, that we're just talking about color f at this point, plant color or pea, or pea pod or pea color. I guess we're calling it pea color. Um, so the parent generation which is that first call, a first uh, block, if you will, the light yellow block, is talking about um, one parent has the two dominant, homozygous dominant uh, yellow, and the other parent is the homozygous recessive green. Okay, that's your P gen or parent generation. When they cross, um, they give you a heterozygous F1 offspring. Okay, so you've got um, each one is going to donate one gamete to the offspring, okay? Because you've got one mother and one father, and you're going to distribute one, only one of those genes to your offspring. The offspring doesn't need two dominant yellows and two recessive greens. It only needs one dominant yellow and one recessive green, because that's how the distribution works, okay? Your F two generation, or excuse me, your F1 generation now has this heterozygous dominant yellow pea plant. When it self-fertilizes or is crossed with another F1 generation, then those are going to be giving up two kinds of gametes. And so that's what gets put into your F2 generation Punnett square. So your F2 generation is going to have a um, gametes at the top, which would be a capital Y and a lowercase y. One's yellow, one's green, and then the same on the vertical side. Then when you bring them across, you can see that you end up with three dominant yellow colors and one green color. The green color is green because it's a homozygous um, gene that's showing. So you've got two lowercase y's which mimic the P gen, lowercase y's, which is green, okay? Recessiveness there. Then you have three yellow remaining offspring. One of those offspring, that first block, has two capital Y's, which means it's homozygous dominant. So you have one of those. And then you have two remaining yellow ones that are heterozygous yet dominant yellow. Um, you don't really have to say dominant because that's sort of redundant, but um, you have a capital Y and a lowercase y in two of those. So you've got um, uh, two different ways that you're getting these dominant coloring pea plants. And so when you look down, you can typically see, call this in this Punnett square, a three to one phenotypic ratio. And the phenotypic ratio means that it's um, the coloration, the um, trait that you're going to visualize. In this case, it's color. And so you've got three yellow colors and one green color. So it's a three to one phenotypic ratio. Now, if you look at the chart down below, um, we have that written down at the very end of the chart below that, where it says phenotypic ratio on the far right. We've got three yellow and one green. Um, the genotypes in that first column are written down. So you've got the homozygous dominant yellow and the heterozygous yellow, and then the homozygous green. And even though you have two of the heterozygous yellows, you don't have to write them twice, okay? Um, so that means you have one homozygous dominant, you have two of the heterozygous yellows, even though one's not written in that column there, and then one homozygous recessive, okay? So now the genotypic ratio that we got from the Punnett square says it's a one to two to one ratio, okay? So the genotypic ratio is written a little differently than the phenotypic ratio. Don't get those backwards, don't mix them up, okay? Make sure you understand. Phenotype, you're looking at a trait that you can visualize, in this case it's color. So when I look at that Punnett square, I can go, oh, there's yellow and there's green. Okay, well how many, 
how many squares are yellow? There's three. How many are green? One. So that's my phenotypic ratio, three to one. And then you do the same thing for the genotypes, which are the actual lettering uh, representations. Here's another way to look at a Punnett square. This is a monohybrid cross, meaning we're just looking at one trait. Um, so you've got your female gametes at the top, you've got the male gametes at the bottom. We'll say that they're both homozygous, one's recessive, one's uh, dominant, and then it shows you how to bring them down and across. Um, so this is the, the actual functioning way of a, of a monohybrid Punnett square. These are so much easier to do than the dihybrids. <laughs> you'll, you'll learn to appreciate these once you get into the dihybrids. But um, notice how you just keep doing that per square, bringing down one from the top and one across from the bottom or on the side, and uh, you end up with a completed Punnett square at the bottom. And then from here, you can look at your genotypic ratio and your phenotypic ratio. And this particular one, you can't really tell what the phenotypic ratio is because there's no coloration going on. You could look at it in the sense of um, genotype for sure, and you could guess probably at the, you know, the the phenotypic one. And essentially, you know that it's a three to one ratio, so you know that three of these are going to be the same, and one of them is not. Here's another representation of the monohybrid cross for a first generation. So remember, you've got um, the uh, parent plant that had um, bred true, and um, that's shown here in the purple plant, and then also in the white plant. So these are true bred plants. These are your P gen. And so you've got the parent plant, it says homozygous for purple and parent plant homozygous for white. Um, when they cross, we get the F1 generation, which means that we're taking a gamete from one parent and a gamete from the other parent. We're combining them to get two gametes, which are um, equate to your, for, or your F1 generation. Um, it, and here in this case, we've got a capital P and a lowercase p, which means it's heterozygote. Um, there's a dominant coloring, which would be the P, or excuse me, be the purple, because that's where the dominant came from. And so your first generation offspring are always dominant if they're coming from true bred parents. Here is a monohybrid cross for your second generation. So remember, we just had um, the first generation, which was a heterozygote, which means there's a capital um, and a lowercase for both. And so you've got a capital and a lowercase across the top, and then you have a capital and lowercase um, vertically on the side. And then you bring each across, and you end up getting that three to one phenotypic ratio which means there's three purple and one white. And then you have a one to two to one genotypic ratio. So if you look, you can see that first purple block is two capital P's. That is homozygous dominant. And then you have two heterozygous purple plants because so, the two remaining have a capital P and a lower P. So that's your two. And then your white is your homozygous recessive because they have two lowercase p's, so they're white. So you've got one uh, heterozygous, or excuse me, one homozygous dominant to two heterozygous um, heterozygotes and to one homozygous recessive. Okay, so a one to two to one ratio there for genotype. So the um, rule of independent assortment um, pertains to these um, crosses. Uh, they're just showing a monohybrid cross here, but typically a dihybrid cross will illustrate this independent assortment um, in a uh, better fashion than what a monohybrid would. Um, so basically the rule of independent assortment means that 
the trait, one trait is not affecting another trait when we're doing these crosses. So let's say I'm looking at plant color and plant height. Whatever mixture I get from my parent generation to my F1 generation to my F2 generations um, for color are not going to affect um, anything for plant height from my parent generation to the F1 to the F2 generations. So the um, distribution of plant color is going to be its own vein or own avenue, if you will. And then the distribution for the plant height would be a separate avenue. Okay, so they wouldn't affect one another in this combination of genes. And we'll look at this more closely in a dihybrid cross. Okay, to illustrate this um, law of independent assortment, we're gonna look at this dihybrid cross. It gets complicated very quickly, so we'll try to go slowly through it. And um, I myself would write it a little bit differently just for my own brain's sake, but um, you might do it the same, but we'll look at it as it is and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, so they're gonna start you with the P generation. Remember the parent generation are true bred plants in this case for um, specific uh, phenotypes. In this case, we are talking about seed color and seed texture. So the color can either be yellow or green and the texture will either be smooth or wrinkly. So we've got two traits going on here. So the parent generation shows that the yellow one is dominant for yellow color and smoothness. So those are the dominant traits. The recessive traits are green and wrinkly. And then when they cross, they get a combination of such where both the dominants are gonna be showing. So we've got um, dominant yellow and dominant wrinkled happening. But we also, because they're, uh, it's an F1 generation, it's combining the two F, uh, P generations, you're still also going to have the um, lowercase y and the lowercase r in there because they're heterozygotes. So remember, your F1 generation is going to be a heterozygous for the dominant traits. Okay. So we've got all four letters of what we want in that F1 generation. That's what goes into your um, dihybrid cross, essentially. So what you're going to do is you're going to take every combination of Y and R that you have and put it across the top and then put it across the side. Okay, and then you can start bringing them down like we do in a monohybrid cross, but just bring them down like you normally would. And then you can look and see that you're going to have, let's do phenotype first. In your phenotype, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 yellows and four greens, 12 to four greens. We don't really do it that way, but for now, we'll just say 12 to four. Um, for your genotype, we've got nine to three to three to one. And what that means is, let's start with the one green one. So the green wrinkled is recessive, recessive is down here in the lower right. The, um, then you've got similar threes And then you have the green, the three green, and then you've got nine of the other phenotype, okay? So it gets very complicated when you look at this, and I'm not going to say them out loud because I will get them confused um, when I write, when I actually verbalize them, because uh, I actually say them differently than what's here. Um, but just know that when you are doing a dihybrid cross for two traits, you're, and you're starting with pure generations, two pure generations for both those traits. Um, your F1 generation is going to be heterozygous dominant, dominant sort of redundant term there. Um, you're going to put down every combination 
of that heterozygote um, for those two traits um, across the top and across the side for your dihybrid cross. Then you just bring your everything across and everything down and you fill out this um, the square and you end up with a um, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio. Okay, so 9 yellow to 3 green to 3 yellow to 1 green. So another thing that can happen that's important to understand uh, during all of this segregation of gametes and um, production of these phenotypes that we're looking at or even genotypes um, based on you know your P generation, your F1 generation, F2 generation, etc. Um, we got to understand that we have this thing called random segregation. So if you think back to meiosis, um, during meiosis 1, you have this possibility of getting four different combinations of uh, gametes. And so this uh, figure illustrates on the top that if you start um, with the parent generation, you've got a, the, the, the single circle at the top has a big blue X, a big red X, and then a low, a small blue X and a small red X. Those can segregate out into, if you have blues on one side and reds on the other, that will end up with two gametes of all blue, one large, one small, and then the other possibility would be the red side, which should be one big, one small, and the two gametes there. Um, another possibility is if you had the, started with the same thing and they segregated out, but you had one big blue and one small red, then those are going to mix in the gametes. And same with if you had the opposite, the big red and the little blue, then those would come out mixed um, in the uh, final gamete possibility. So you've got four potential um, gamete solutions from this random segregation. Everything we've learned up until this point has been Mendelian genetics. These are the things that Gregor Mendel discovered during his um, study of the garden pea plant um, based on those seven traits that he looked at. And for not having a lot of technology in his realm and previous um, studies to, to refer to, um, he did an incredible job of giving us our foundation in our phenotypes and our genotypes, what we look like, those inherited traits. Um, but then, 100 years later, we got a lot better equipment. Um, we have many more scientific minds. Um, just as a side note, what I mean by that is back in Mendel's day, uh, there weren't many people doing science. There weren't men of science back then um, as a whole because um, the world was ruled by religion and science and religion clashed. And so um, they sort of uh, scientists sort of kind of went under the radar as being called naturalists and that was a little bit more accepting because you're looking at the natural world but it still was not under the realm of religion and so it was still taboo so for a monk to do all these studies was quite incredible at the time uh, but now we've got all this technology and things and now we've come up with some other observances that we've discovered and so now we're in the non-mendelian genetics um, it's going beyond that simplicity that we've just learned. Um, it takes into account, we're sort of building on what we've just learned. So let's refresh. An allele is an alternate form of a gene and may be fully dominant, incompletely dominant, or co-dominant. Okay? Incomplete dominance is where one allele is not fully dominant over another. Uh, so your heterozygous phenotype is between the two homozygous phenotypes. Um, up until now, we've said it's either dominant or recessive, right? And it's either um, uh, homozygous dominant or it's heterozygous dominant. Well, this is saying one's not fully dominant over the other. It's not an either or situation. It's a little bit of both. Um, Codominance is the same thing, or not the same thing, but same idea. Codominance is two alleles that are both fully expressed 
in a heterozygous individuals. So um, let's take a look at some pictures that will, I think this will make more sense. So this is a perfect example of incomplete dominance. These are um, heterozygotes, and um, what we're seeing here is a pink plant. And so incomplete dominance is sort of a blending of the two characteristics that we had. So this particular plant started with parents that were um, true bred for pink, or excuse me, true bred for red and true bred for white. And when they had the F1 generation, they, instead of picking one or the other, the dominant one to show, um, it actually blended the two into a pink plant. So the F1 generation became a pink um, phenotype, and um, it's now considered an incomplete dominant state. Here's your other example. So if you started with two purebred plants, um, one was red, one was white. Um, the F1 generation, if you ended up with a co-dominant situation, both traits are going to be fully expressed as in this um, speckled pink flower. You've got pink, or I should say these should be red. Um, red leaves and white leaves together on one flower bud. Um, so if you look at the little four squares a, a, next to it, it's pretty easy to understand. So you've got a, a dominant red plant, you have a white recessive plant, incomplete dominance when the two mix, they blend and make a pink. So it's just like when you mix red paint and white paint it becomes pink, same idea here. And then you have a co-dominant plant, which is a complete blending of the two. Both are fully expressed. One's not dominant over the other at all. They are co-dominant together. Here's another um, example of codominance um, dealing with blood type, um, human blood type. And so we've done a Punnett square. Um, blood type is written with the capital or um, lowercase i, and then either the A or the B um, sort of as a superscript um, next to it. So it can get a little confusing when you're writing it, so make sure you write very clearly. Um, and purposefully of what you, you mean. So they've done a Punnett square here for a co-dominant cross. Um, what happens is you have the A and the B at, at the top and again at, on the side. And so when you cross the two A's, you actually just get the blood type A. When you cross the AB, you get an AB blood type and again on the bottom. And then the last one would be you cross the two B's, but you, uh, we just call it a B blood type. So you get this um, genotypical ratio of one to two to one, okay? And so this is just a codominant situation where A's and B's can be expressed codominantly. This figure is showing the inheritance of the ABO blood system in humans. This gets complicated very quickly. And again, um, you have to be careful with how you write um, these letters with the I's and the A's or B's um, above them, that, which is called a superscript. So make sure if you're doing a lowercase i, you make a make it clear that that's what that is. Um, so as you know, you can get one gene from your parent, from your mother, one gene from your father. From okay, so both parents give you two genes, but within the population of humans, we'll say, um, many different variations of blood types can happen. So let's say your mother had A and your father had B and um, you ended up with A, B blood type. Okay, that kind of falls right in line with what we're used to. We get one from our father, one from our mother, and we get a combination of the two. We just learned that blood types co-dominant, so now I can ex fully express the A, B together. Um, however, we also know that A, B blood types kind of rare, and that there are other blood type possibilities out there in the population. And so that's what this inheritance is talking about. We can have A blood, we can have O blood, we can have B blood, we can have AB blood. And then that doesn't even get into like the RH factors that you've learned about in laboratory. Um, and so let me just sort of read you some stuff to help you make sense of this. Um, so 
In the human ABO blood type system, we've got all three alleles, A, B, and O, circulating in the human population. The um, dominant A allele, which is a capital I with a capital A, uh, codes for the A molecules on the red blood cell and has the A blood type. Um, the capital I with the capital B subscript allele codes for B molecules um, on the surface of red blood cells and gives you the B blood type. If the lowercase i allele codes for no molecules on the red blood cell type, then that would be an O blood type. So in this case, the capital I A and the capital I B are codominant with each other, which we just learned. So you can have an A B blood type together right? Um, and then they are both dominant over any uh, lowercase i. So you could have a lowercase i a and a lowercase i b or two lowercase i's which equals the O blood type. All right, so that gets a little complicated pretty fast, but just take it slowly. Think about what you're doing. You've got, we're now talking about all the possibilities within the world of humans, what blood types we possess, um, how they're combined, that they can be co-dominant with each other, and that two of the blood types, or in this case actually three of the blood types, are dominant over one blood type. So dominant A, dominant B, co-dominant AB are all dominant over recessive O. Hopefully that makes sense. This is just showing you kind of an illustration of what we just talked about. So if you are blood type A or AO, or you are, um, you're going to be a blood type A basically. And so this is showing you your genotypes and your phenotypes. So if you've mixed, your mother and your father gave you both A's um, or an A and an O, then you're, you're an A blood type because remember A is dominant over O, right? Um, let's say you have A and B from your parents. That would be an AB blood type. If you had both your parents give you a B or one give you a B and one give you an O, that B is dominant over the O, so you get a B blood type. And then if both parents gave you O's, those are recessive, but they're both giving it the same, so you get the O blood type. So hopefully that made sense. <laughs> And we don't ever say AO blood type or OO or BO. It's just the genes. That's how the genes line up to give you what the phenotype looks like. This is a picture of um, the fly called Drosophila. Um, the fly, this particular fly species is used heavily in genetic um, studies. They are easy to manipulate and they have very similar DNA to humans. So it's a good choice um, when we're doing genetic studies. Um, but the easy manipulation is the, the fun part about them is that we can do whatever we want to them and they'll, they'll really um, exhibit what we do to them quite nicely. Uh, one thing before we get into the sex link traits, which is the heading of this um, particular slide, uh, go back a little bit to your multiple alleles and your ABO blood types. When it was talking about, um, you may have a type A blood, let's say, but the population of humans out there has um, several possibilities of blood types. You've got the A, the O, the AB, the B, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so within that, what they talk about um, are the wild type um, genotypes and phenotypes. So it says, uh, when many alleles exist for the same gene, the convention is to denote the most common phenotype or genotype in the natural population as the wild population or the wild type um, indicated with a plus or a plus sign. Okay. All other the all other phenotypes and genotypes are considered variants or mutants to the wild type. Or the typical form. Um, so they, this means that they deviate from the wild type. The variant may be recessive or dominant to the wild type uh, alleles. And so that's kind of what this is showing here. 
we are considering red eye color as the wild type and then the white eye color would be um, recessive to or a variant to that red color okay and so the what red is dominant over the Y <laughs> the red is dominant over the white eye color okay so this chart is talking about sex linked traits um, sex linked traits are those that um, are only found in one sex or the other so for example um, you we might think that color blindness is just a male trait um, yes it's true that most colorblind people are male however there are cases where some can be female, but it is considered a sex linked trait because it determines or it is determined by what allele is on your sex gametes or your, or your um, sex chromosomes. Okay, so we're looking only at the X's and Y's um, in humans, for example. Um, those are the traits that we have. So um, a female is XX and a male is XY okay a male can only be a male if he has a Y chromosome now in this case um, this uh, example that they're showing is the Drosophila fly with the red eye and the white eye um, they're talking about wild populations um, and alternate populations and so Everything is in relation to wild. Wild would be considered the norm or normal. So in this case of Drosophila, um, the wild type has red eye allele, and that means it's a normal occurrence. And so um, anything that is different, like a white, would be a recessive trait in the Drosophila eye coloring. Um, again, and it's sex linked. Um, I believe in this case, it's the male that have the red eyes and the females that would have uh, white eyes, but uh, I guess it could be either. Yeah, I guess it could be either way. The, that's what this Punnett square is trying to show. Um, the things that I want you to understand about sex linked chromosomes is, or sex linked um, traits is that they are determined determinant upon the sex of the person we're talking about or organism uh, they can have dominant or recessive um, let's say for example in humans we would probably call it normal and abnormal or appearing and not appearing um, present and not present would probably be the best way to say it uh, in other animals we call them wild type and regular type or recessive type uh, the, again these are notated um, as capitals and and lowercase so if you look at this picture um, it's talking about um, they list the X and the Y and the X chromosome will have either the uh, notation for wild or uh, normal or recessive um, I guess mutant is what they're calling it so the big type is the the big W is wild type and the little W is uh, mutant type and so they'll have an XY for male and the X will have either a capital W or a lowercase w and the um, the you know, subscripts here the, the capital W and the lower case W um, or no matter what trait you're talking about uh, for sex linked organisms they only go on the X the Y is not a large enough chromosome to really have anything on it other than genes for um, testes formation and function okay therefore all the other sex linked um, traits have to be occurring on the X chromosome because it's a lot bigger, has a lot more space, and it can hold all those different types of um, genes or alleles, okay? And so the, uh, if you look at the very first fly with the red eye, that is a male fly. So it's got an X and a Y chromosome. And then it looks like it has a capital W 
on the X because that's indicating that the eye is a red wild type. Well, remember, red eyes only found in the wild. And then if you look at the female fly um, is an XX, both those Xs can have um, notations on them. So in this case, the um, female has a white eye. And so the lowercase um, W on both Xs appears. Okay, And then we do the... Um, Punnett square of the female gametes and the male gametes and we cross them and yada yada we have the um, our final result okay and so it looks like it's 50 50 you can get red eye and white eye uh, without looking at it more in depth but um, sex chromosomes are determined by the sex and then we notate them um, usually the sub superscript is written in a capital or lowercase letter on the X chromosome because the Y chromosome isn't large enough to have that particular allele. This slide is showing you how crossing over takes place. Um, think back to when you were learning about meiosis and um, we were um, ending up basically with four haploid cells um, or gametes. In this process, you've got these two homologous chromosomes. So you've got the blue X and the red X. Those are homologous chromosomes. And on one homologous chromosome, there will be um, alleles uh, with designations of capital A, capital B, capital C. And you'll notice that it's on both legs of the homologous chromosome. Pardon me. And then, um, on the red is the exact same thing, only they are lowercase letters. Now, if they did not cross over, when they ended up dividing and going through this whole process, um, the um, offspring or the gametes would have the exact same combination of um, capital um, letter alleles or lowercase letter alleles as their parent chromosomes. Um, crossing over uh, allows us to have variety in our genetic pool, okay? And so if you look at the middle portion of this thing, of this um, chart, you'll see that the lower legs of the blue and the red are, are close enough together where they can just sort of cross over and swap those components that they have, so like their feet, if you will. And then if you look at the um, end, it'll have the recombinant chromosomes, which means they've crossed over completely and now they're back to their X shape. Um, but now you, you can see they each have a different foot on them. I like to call them feet because it just makes sense to me. <laughs> um, so now when these divide and end up with gametes, you'll have a combination of uh, possibilities here. Now note that there are two one on the blue and one on the red, uh, non-recombinant chromosomes. Those are going to stay exactly the same as the parent. Um, however, the recombinant chromosomes, which are notated here by the swapping of the feet, those can get a variation of combinations um, in the A's and the B's, the capitals and the lowercase. And so we get this um, bigger genetic pool happening. We have more possibilities, more diversity, um, and that, that's what we want in our, in our world, is we want diversity. If we don't have diversity, then, you know, clearly we're all the same, and that can be boring. <laughs> um, it can also cause, uh, be cause for disease and things, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so that's what crossing over is. It's just a recombination of some of the alleles on, or genes on a chromosome. We've been talking mostly about um, a simplistic view of genetic um, inheritance where we've got two genes with maybe one or two alleles and we're talking about one trait and yada yada. Um, genes, as you can imagine, just like people, are far more complicated than this simplistic view of what we've been talking about. Um, there are instances called polygenic inheritance, where um, one or more, or I should say two or more genes are acting to create a trait or are um, withholding or inhibiting 
other genes to make a, a specific trait. And so this is called polygenic inheritance. And within that, um, we get these situations where we have one gene suppressing or expressing um, uh, the traits of another gene. Okay, so epistasis by definition is um, the interaction between genes such that one gene masks or interferes with the expression of another gene. And to that, um, you can say sort of that the, there will be one gene that will um, silence another gene. Okay, and so the gene that's not being expressed or that is silent is said to be hypostatic, while the gene that's doing the expressing and suppressing um, is the epistatic gene. And so um, we can look here in this picture, figure eight, 18 of these mice. Um, it's a little difficult to see, but um, the gene that is labeled C will mask the expression of A for coat color. And when the C allele is present, the coat color is expressed. When it is absent, which would indicate two little Cs, um, no coat color is expressed, which means it's an albino situation. Um, coat color will depend on the A gene, which shows a dominance with the recessive homozygote showing a different phenotype than the heterozygote or dominant homozygote. So you've got these three options here. You've got the agouti, the um, black, and the albino. And so when um, we have one gene of the albino, or I should say C, uh, masking the other genes, you get this albino effect. So in this particular um, chart, there are four albino possibilities. Um, if you have a capital A over another one, then you'll get the, um, the agouti, I believe. And then um, if there's a recessive showing or the third type, it would be the black ones. So it gets a little complicated, but um, think of epistasis as um, one gene acting upon many other genes or they're suppressing other genes so that they can express um, their own sense of self, if you will. <laughs> okay, so that one's a little more difficult. It, um, it can happen in eye color in humans as well. Um, so we've got multiple alleles happening there. Here's an example of the epistasis. Um, I think this is a little bit better than the previous one, but um, so it says some traits are affected by multiple gene products and affect called polygenic inheritance or epistasis. And so here we've got the, we've got black chocolate and a cream color, I guess, or E is the ability to express pigment or coat color. And little case E is the inability to express dark pigment or coat color. Okay, and so if you look, the black dog has all capitals, and so he's got the ability to express that black color. The chocolate lab has the lowercase b's, but it has capital E's, which means it's going to, um, it's allowing that coat color to sh come through. So if you have a capital E in here anywhere, it's going to say, hey, whatever coat color you're trying to be, I'm gonna um, flip a switch here and allow that to happen, okay? With the lowercase e, the exact opposite is true. It's um, inability to express that dark pigment. So if you have a lowercase e with the black or the um, chocolate, if it's the more dominant e in the situation, then you're gonna end up with a light colored lab, a cream colored lab like on here. So um, it, that one's a little bit more difficult to, to process, but it's overshadowing basically the black or the chocolate coloring. Um, so it's many genes with um, half, half, having to deal with one trait, like coat color. So many genes, one trait. Here's another example of polygenic phenotype, um, which is eye color. Um, there might be 16 genes involved in making one eye color. So there's many gene possibilities for one trait. 
um, pleiotropy, um, it's not really in your textbook, I don't believe, but I wanted to just put it out there for um, an example an, of an opposite to what we were just talking about. So epistasis, you can think of it as um, many genes creating one trait, whereas pleiotropy is the opposite. It's um, one gene can create multiple traits. So epistasis, multiple genes, one trait, and then pleiotropy is just one gene, multiple traits. Um, in this case, the multiple traits here would be um, the index finger being able to bend backwards and the thumb being able to be bent downwards, which I can do both of those, by the way. <laughs> So there are more to these genetic combinations and what we call them and how we get them and stuff like that, but um, we've touched on the main key points. It does get a little more sticky and complicated once we get into the non-Mendelian genetics, but um, if you take it slowly and really um, sort of section it off into groups um, by type, it should make more sense. So um, take your time and study a lot with this one and uh, there'll be a lot of questions from this chapter on your final exam so um, be sure you really understand this okay email me with questions thanks guys